It is Monday, April 9th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very productive get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Monday. Although, I gotta say, it pales in comparison to the ass kicking I got on on Saturday, honestly. Uh, so I did compete for the very, very, very first time in my adult life <clears throat> in anything other than other than like fishing tournaments. And uh, so I, I went to, um, oh shit, where was that? Liberty School, I think, or Liberty High School or something like that in uh, Hillsboro and competed in the... Um, the last uh, sub league uh, qualifier, and um, I got to say I was a bit disappointed with my performance. Um, the uh, gentleman that I was rolling with um, roundly defeated me. I mean, let me tell you, there was no doubt as to who was in control for the for pretty much the entire time. The guy had me on the bottom and. Uh, he had me pinned in such a way in um, in a uh, side control where I couldn't I couldn't twist up on either side, and that's really what you need to do if you've got somebody who's trying to isolate one of your arms and has you in side control. Is you, you got to get up on your side. You either you have to get up on one side and give them your back, or you have to get up on the other side and try and get your knee between you and them. And uh, you know, I just I failed. Yeah, but I I want to be honest with you here. You know, it's like this that for the most part I I just took it as something that you know, I I'm I considered comp- competition to be an inevitability. You know, whether I was any good at it or not was was kind of immaterial, but I think the best test, you know, other than of course a, a real life actual fight out in the real world um other than that the best test of your jiu-jitsu is is competition you know because there are uh, there are some of those competitions where money is actually on the line it's not a whole lot of money but i'll break your arm for 500 bucks you don't tap quick enough i'll break your arm for 500 bucks sorry that that that's what we're doing here. We're we're not simulating breaking arms. We're putting you in the position of breaking your arm unless you tap. Now, of course, when you're when you're just practicing, you're just in class. That's not the intent. You're not trying to kill your your uh, classmates and your teammates. Um, but in the in the longer term, you know, in the in the greater context of jujitsu, yes. You want to be able to be breaking people's arms, and it, it being an option as to whether or not you you do. Now, this is not to say it's a matter of badassery, because honestly, I've learned nothing but humility in fucking jujitsu. <laughs> I mean, really, that I learned. If there was no other lesson to be derived from this weekend, it was humility. That that was that was a real big one, because. I found out for certain there is somebody out there that is way fucking better than I am. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, it's these, you need to do these things. You need to test your boundaries. You need to get outside your comfort zone. You need to experience some new shit. This is the only place where, you, where you're really tested as an individual and where you find your real character is at the moments when you're tested and of course tournaments are a somewhat controlled environment but you know for the most part I knew nothing about my opponent I had mild to negative preparation for the event and, uh, and I'll get into that um, and uh, in all in all honesty I was not prepared for the event and and to me, evidence of that is that we had a gentleman, uh, Nathan, who just like completely kicked ass. And he is, of course, one of my teammates from uh, Northwest. And uh, yeah, like I said, he, he, but you know, every time I'm at the, the dojo, he is there. I mean, like the only times that I haven't seen him there yet 
has been at the 6 a.m. Monday morning class or uh, open open mat. That's the only time that I've I've ever been there in that building and not seen Nathan. And that gives you an idea of the level of dedication that he has to what he's doing. And certainly, I gotta up mine a notch or two. But so you know, I, I, that was the lesson immediately to be derived from it. And you know where I was at six a.m. this morning? That's right, I was at jujitsu, open mat. Um, and uh, the first thing, of course, that I that I was working on this morning was takedown defense. Because let me tell you, that dude took me down. I mean, there there was no, there was almost no effort on his part. It was just like, okay, I'm going to squeeze him by his elbows, and I'm just going to kick this foot out from under him and lean this way, and he's going to fall over, and then I'm going to be on side control and and dominate him and then, like, break his arm. Because <laughs> that, that's pretty much how it went down. You know, I mean, I, I think the second match I managed to hold up for just a teeny tiny longer. I stayed on my feet for just a moment longer. And I did manage to avoid getting stuck in an arm bar for just a moment. And then he flicked me back into a position for an arm bar and took it. So point being that I, I lasted like 15 seconds longer than the previous match. And then that, I guess that was an achievement. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like I, I had told um, one of the uh, one of the owners of the dojos that ultimately... My my real goal for this particular competition was to get context because, you know, I could have watched videos all day long and I, I could have talked to everybody at my dojo and still not been any closer to what I actually experienced than if I was actually experiencing it. And, and so, you know, I, I couldn't get any closer without actually doing it, so I did it. And now I have some sort of context and, and some ideas of what what I needed to work on. And um, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm tempted to post a video and, and like some sort of narrative in the background saying something to the, the effect of, you know, that every time you, you are debating whether or not you want to go to the dojo or every time you're, you're saying to yourself that, you know, wh- whether or not I, wh- whether or not I should actually be doing this or whatever, watch this video. Because this is what it looks like when you make the wrong decisions at those points. This is what it looks like when you take that that to competition. When you didn't go to the dojo and you didn't you didn't train a certain way and you didn't work on your holes and anything like that. That's what it looks like. You go completely unprepared and you get your ass handed to yourself. <laughs> But you know, like I said, it was a it was a learning experience, and I intend to do it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not deterred. If anything, I I have something to work toward now, or at least some expectation of of what to improve upon. And like I said, I just I didn't have that kind of context until I went. And uh, yeah, to my opponent, you're excellent, excellent. And uh, should we ever meet on the mat again, I hope to kick the shit out of you. Anyway, with that, I want to go ahead and drop it down into some music, and uh, I've got it right here, so here it is, Prong, Divide and Conquer, First Dance, here on Coin Metal. And that was Sepultura with Subtraction. Yeah, I know, I went a little bit overboard on the music there, just a little bit, but... Honestly, I was half naked, and I was uh, was icing my arm. And uh, it's funny I can't go from one room to another without getting stopped and asked a a, a trade or you know some, some issue like that. And so I had to deal with it. Had to had to assist in a stop loss order, which honestly I don't do. Um or. I haven't done until relatively recently, I should say. <clears throat> For the most part, I just go with limit orders. I mean, that's that's just been the way I've traded this whole time. But stop losses do make sense, and uh, I would be the last to advise people not to do so. So, 
I, I'm not a... Uh, I actually, I, I kind of consider myself to be like the worst trader in all of crypto. I mean, I, every once in a while, I'll, I'll hit a good stretch, but, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not consistent enough to call myself quote-unquote good. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I, I've kept myself busy, but that's... <sighs> That's about it, you know. A little bit, a little bit better than busy, and you know, I guess that's the best that could be hoped for at this time in some of the markets. You know, I guess some some of the other coins have been suffering quite a bit, Bitcoin being one of them. But you know, I think Bitcoin has been suffering its own issues with regard to its scaling issue. Um, although it, it seems like there's there's no big issue with scaling anymore, yeah. If you if you look at the Bitcoin network, um, the last time I checked on Segwit Party, um, s- about sixty five to sixty eight percent of all the transactions that are happening on the Bitcoin network are still standard Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin addresses, you know, that start with a one. I uh, I don't know if if ones that start with a three, even though that is a uh, <clears throat> a normal multi-sig wallet address, um, but I don't know if those count as non-Segwit. But according to Segwit Party's own numbers, um, like I said, about sixty-eight percent of the transactions are still regular Bitcoin transactions. And uh, and on top of that, they're not even uh, they're not even filling blocks anymore. And uh, I, I think that's that's pretty telling. Is that enough of the transactive activity is going to other coins that they're not they're not scraping the top of those blocks anymore. So at least at least not regularly. I. I I didn't notice any any regularity to the pattern of uh, there actually being any, but uh, that's that's really telling to me that even after all this time, all all the propaganda, all the censorship, all the bullshit, Bitcoin is still ticking along at sixty eight percent of the transactions, and. Um, you know, if the if the demand for Bitcoin stays where it is, I I don't see why we would need to go above one megabyte blocks. You know, and then and the lightning will have gotten their little wish. But <clears throat> there won't be any utility for lightning because, of course, the block space will be cheap enough to afford to do on-chain transactions. Anyway, uh, I I got a series of well, actually, I got a whole bunch of different uh, different stuff to talk about today. But this is the one I wanted to start off with because it's from a quote unquote legit news source, whatever that is these days. Uh, excuse me for one moment while I hydrate. There we go. All right, so here we go. This is on uh, CNBC, and uh, this was authored by Kate Rooney, so clearly no penis. Um, and this was published, let's give it a reload so we can figure out exactly when, approximately seven hours ago, updated four hours ago, so we're getting it fresh. Another Goldman exec dumps Wall Street for crypto world. <clears throat> Early cryptocurrency investor Mike Novogratz has hired Goldman Sachs executive Richard Kim as the new chief operating officer for his merchant bank, Galaxy Digital, according to a person familiar with the matter. Kim, whose LinkedIn profile says he was an executive director based in the bank's London office, joins Luka Jankovic, a former Goldman Sachs hedge fund analyst, according to the bank's alumni, now at Galaxy Digital. 
Kim's exit, first reported by Bloomberg News, is among a handful of high-profile transitions from Goldman Sachs to cryptocurrency startups. Block Tower Capital recruited former Goldman executive Michael Busella in January. Former, Gold, former Goldman Vice President Mike Goetz, or I'm sorry, Matt Goetz, founded Block Tower last year. James Rat- Radicke was a managing director at the bank and left in 2016 to work in strategic investing at another cryptocurrency firm, according to his LinkedIn page. He's now a global head of business development at Cumberland Mining, one of the largest traders of cryptocurrencies. Hmm. A Galaxy spokesperson declined to comment on the hiring. Novogratz, who worked at Goldman Sachs during the 1990s, told reporters at The New Yorker that the firm, quote, hired Goldman's best guy in blockchain in April in an April issue. It's unclear whether he was referring to Kim or another executive. <clears throat> Bitcoin's rise to almost $20,000 in December has attracted other Wall Street traders and a surge of new hedge funds in the in the space. The number of crypto funds rose to 245 this year, up from 167 last year, and only 19 firms in 2016, according to the latest numbers from research firm Autonomous Next. Galaxy Digital manages assets for blockchain-related ventures, including cryptocurrency. Novogratz, who left Fortress Investment Group in 2015 after the fund lost money, told CNBC in November that Bitcoin could multiply more than four times by the end of this year. Quote, Bitcoin could be at 40,000 by at the end of 2018. It easily could, Michael Novogratz said on CNBC's Fast Money. Quote, Ethereum, which I think just touched 500 or is getting close, should be triple where it is as as well. Bitcoin's price has fallen more than 52% this year after starting 2018 above $14,000, according to Coindesk. The entire cryptocurrency market has lost more than half its market capitalization since the beginning of this year, according to data from CoinMarketCap. In December, Novogratz announced he would delay plans to launch what would have been the largest digital currency fund on record. Quote, We're supposed to launch on December 15th, and we paused. Novogratz told CNBC late last year, quote, I didn't like the market conditions as a starting point to take other investors' money. Pfft, what a fool. Quote, we are still feverishly building out a full merchant bank for crypto, i.e., I am still very bullish on the space, i.e., he's accumulating. <clears throat> and see here. Oh, watch. Crypto, college students mining cryptocurrency in dorm rooms. Apparently, that's still a thing. Cool. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> there we have it. And, and this, is, um, this is one of the other techniques for market consumption that we've seen in previous eras where in addition to it's like a three-prong attack you know you got former Goldman people in government who are directing the authorship of bills and and uh, the the terms of regulations and so on and so forth then on the other end you have VC firms which are all basically Goldman Sachs shell corporations Gaslighting all of these little firm, all of these little funds and 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 projects and shit. You know they give them all kinds of money with some caveat. 
that, you know, should they need money in the future that Goldman Sachs would have, you know, maybe carte blanche on, on an offer for, for more funding, right? And then, of course, when that that funding round comes, you know, to to necessity. I mean, all the all the little all the little people they're looking at it and they're saying, "Oh, you know, that we've got this guarantee in the background that Goldman Sachs is going to bail us out, so you know, we can go ahead and push a little bit here and push a little bit there." Then everything goes wrong, right? For whatever reason, and they end up back at Goldman Sachs's table with their hand out, right? But now. They're over a barrel because they've gone through funds that they didn't earn, meaning they didn't have the they don't have the productive capacity to replace those funds, and so now their funding is going to be exclusively loans, and they're going to be getting those terms dictated to them by either Goldman themselves or one of these little sh- uh, sock puppet groups, right? And that's what this like block tower capital business is. That's basically just Goldman Sachs. You might as well just like erase that. And because a former Goldman executive is running the thing and hiring former Goldman executives, I mean, really, you know, just like they're reconstituting the boardroom in another boardroom, you know, or in several other little boardrooms. And so it makes it look like there's all these other little firms out there, blah, 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 right? But they're all really Goldman Sachs. And Goldman ultimately will be dictating the terms to these, these other little startups that come along when, again, they go, they go through all their VC capital and they're, they're back at Goldman's desk going, can you please help us? We're so close. We just need another $10 million. Sure, no problem. But you're gonna have to give us fifteen percent stake, <laughs> or or maybe one percent or two percent. I don't know what the percentage would start at, but they would start shark tanking them, you know. And because most of these projects are run by kids, for whom this is their first fucking job. You know, and they they've been all high and mighty and thinking they're they're big fish because amongst the group of little fish that they are running or leading, they are the big fish. You know, but then you you put them in the room with some sharks, and it turns out they're just anchovies. They're not even they're not even anchovies. They're like they're like phytoplankton and shit. You know, and these people are dictating to them saying. Okay, you will give us a stake in your shit if we give you money. And I mean, this uh, to me, this is what happened with Poloniex. Is that Circle, which is Goldman Sachs, or one of those. It's either Goldman Sachs or Chase or somebody like that. But they're, they're not Circle. They're, they're owned by some, somebody else. And that would be... I'm pretty sure that's Goldman Sachs. So anyway, um, they... Uh, they sold to Circle. Poloniex sold to Circle for $400 million. Now we're talking about one of the biggest altcoin exchanges on the planet. And they don't have enough liquidity or, or they, they don't have enough equity to get more than $400 million for what's left of their stake. Give me a fucking break, man. They, they, that tells me that they were insolv- they've were been insolvent for probably about two years now. And Circle has been circle jerking them off with, with little pumps saying, Oh yeah, you know, if you just give us a little more of your, of your stake in the company. And then, of course, they all agree to it because they need the fucking money. Because they got hacked or some other shit. And... You know, again, by the by the time it ends, by the time Circle completely consumes Poloni X, they only got four hundred million left in it. That's that's just that, there's no excuse for that. But that is a strategic technique. 
And you fucking people got to watch out for that. Somebody starts waving money in your face saying, Oh, yeah, we'll make all your problems go away. You just got to, you know, you just got to sign right here and, you know, give us exclusive and, 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 oh, fuck. You might as well just walk out of the room. If you intend to be running that project in five years, you might as well walk out of the room. Because inevitably, it's not going to take five years. Inevitably, it's you will be lucky if they keep you as an employee for the next five years. There will be some fuck up. I don't know what it will be, but somebody will fuck up. You know, somebody will bribe a wife and and she'll divorce a, some leader, whatever that puts him in in you know just destroys him, and and there goes your fucking company, right? This shit is strategy. You know, this isn't this isn't patty cake kids. This is fucking money. And you got to be protecting yourself. You got to be looking out for your own bunghole. And the last thing you need to be doing is inviting people into it saying, "Hey, yeah, we could use some of that money." <laughs> Cuz before they before you know it, they they're going to they're going to be running you like Harvey Weinstein, you know? horn you out to their friends and shit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So that's that's what I think of this whole business with regard to uh, um, these companies in, in crypto. And that I, I really think a lot of them are just... They're just sock puppets. You know, they're feeding you Goldman Sachs' money... They're going to be dictating to you Goldman Sachs' terms. And within the next two to five years, they'll all be bought by Goldman Sachs. And they'll all be part of Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs will have weathered the transition from fiat currency into cryptocurrency completely seamlessly. However, and this is the big point, it will only work for Goldman Sachs as long as they are trading publicly mined coins. At some point or another, I know they fantasize that they're going to be running blockchains on other people, other people's devices or their own devices or whatever. But they are, that you will not be knowingly mining them, and that they will be profiting from that. Now, I don't know about you, but I specifically do not invest in Monero because. I have been crypto jacked. I've had my fucking computer taken over by a fucking Monero mining script, and 90% of my fucking computing processes and resources being dedicated to mining Monero that I that I'm not being actually rewarded for. And I completely object to that. That they, they knowingly accept that hashing power on their network. That, that to me is like a big poke in the eye. You know, if you, if you want me to mine your fucking coin, make it worth me mining it. Don't try and steal my fucking system, system resources to mine your shit. Because that just pisses me off. And it just makes me not want to use your shit. You know, I mean, really, I I wouldn't use Bitcoin if I knew that somewhere in the background of my fucking computer there's some script mining Bitcoin for some asshole, and I'm not getting any of it. I I would drop it like a fucking hot rock. <sighs> because you know we're we're in a situation now where we really don't have to accept that type of behavior. You know, if it were the Federal Reserve doing it 10 years ago, we had no choice to accept it because we had no knowledge it was actually happening. Now, it loses some of its value with that. Because the biggest value of Bitcoin is the fact that we can participate in it. If we couldn't participate in it, it wouldn't be valuable to us. If it was of no use to us, it would have no value to us. 
and it has less value to us now than it did back in what December because right now I'm, I'm looking at the price in US dollars on uh, um, bitcoinmanager.com and it's reading here at uh, 672908 for one bitcoin <clears throat> and then the I guess the the uh, day's low was 660 <laughs> 6,660. That's just bad luck. And the high was uh, 7,175.83 according to this. And yeah, currently it's uh, supposedly 67.2908. Or at least the last time they checked. Hmm. Anyway, I got this article here. Rockefeller backed venture firm Venrock to start investing in Bitcoin altcoins. And uh, this was authored on April 9th by uh, Pur- Puryashu Garg. Um, my apologies if I mispronounced that. I had to, had to turn that down a little bit. Let's follow this up really quick because it's just nagging the crap out of me. Is a software engineer who is passionate about machine learning and blockchain technology. He, yes, penis. And uh, so, yeah, and this was authored off April 9th, 2018, at approximately 18:30. Venrock, the venture f- capital firm backed by the Rockefeller family, is throwing its weight behind the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry. And this is not mere speculation, as one of the firm's partners has gone on record suggesting that Venrock is keen on riding the crypto wave. In fact, the firm has reportedly already taken the first step by striking a deal with a cryptocurrency investor group. In a recent conversation with Fortune, David Pakman, a Venrock partner, disclosed the firm's deal with Brooklyn-based Coin Fund. He stated that Venrock, whose net asset currently hovers somewhere around $3 billion, is looking to diversify its financial portfolio and has decided that rapidly growing blockchain sector will be a good bet. Exciting time ahead for promising crypto enterprises. Venrock's venture firm into cryptocurrency enterprise I'm sorry into crypto enterprises shortly after the multi-billion dollar Soros fund management announced their plan to trade cryptocurrency soon and let's go ahead and right click that If all goes well Venrock has all the resources required to boost the growth of promising crypto enterprises in need of financial support for the uninitiated, the firm has an excellent track record of spotting rising startups and helping them make it to the big leagues. In fact, it had been a prominent, oh, I'm sorry, it had a prominent prominent position to play in the success of many tech heavyweights that today dominate their respective industries, Ergo, Apple, and Intel. The partnership with CoinFund signed earlier in, t- in April 2018 will help the VC firm to empower up-and-coming businesses to build exciting new projects based on blockchain technology. CoinFund was founded in 2015 and since its launch, the investor group has backed many successful blockchain ventures. Successful for who and which projects? I mean, I, I, I would really like some specificity there. Anyway, continuing. Bringing the blockchain to traditional tech startups. Speaking of the new deal with Venrock, <coughs> Jake Bruckman, or yeah, Bruckman, co founder of CoinFund, stated that the group is committed to helping out blockchain teams working on quality projects to reach their full potential and is ever ready to collaborate with any organization keen on adding to its efforts. Quote, We'll be working closely with them to help mentor, advise, and support teams in this space, he said, 
before adding, quote, We're trying to cultivate a unique synergy between teams as we see more experienced founders and more traditional tech startups taking up blockchain. <laughs> Whatever. Who's blockchain? Both Pac-Man and Bruckman seem convinced that blockchain technology has a lot to offer to businesses across industries and niches. And yeah, I'm sure they do. The benefit of the advent of crypto is that we have fewer gatekeepers, said Pac-Man in the conversation with Fortune, calling venture capital basically, quote, a gatekeeper industry. He suggested that the time is ripe to put up an effort to change that. Quote, I don't believe a small group of people should make the decisions about which projects can raise money and get off the ground. <laughs> they can't. It is worth noting here that many venture capital firms have recently shown interest in the crypto industry and blockchain related businesses, but among all those keen on making the most out of the so called crypto wave, the Rockefeller's family the Rockefeller family venture firm is arguably one of the wealthiest and has the capability to take things to the next level for many up and coming entities. Yes, I'm sure they do. Yeah, give you take the money. Just take the money. You know, take the ten thousand dollars and let them make eighteen billion on it and you know, be glad you got ten thousand dollars, right? <laughs> Shit. I don't know who these people think they're kidding. But yeah, the there you have it. We're seeing even more even more in um legacy interest in cryptocurrencies, as if there wasn't enough cr of their money already in cryptocurrencies. But you know what the one thing they can't do, and they can spend all the money they want, they can gaslight all the shit they want, all that. The one thing they can't do is make you value it. And I, I, I think that's the the bigger point here. And you know, some governments will say, you know, oh you can only trade coins that Goldman Sachs runs or some shit like that and you know what <laughs> be told to fuck off I mean come on now I mean when was the last time you heard much about Maduro's coin the the uh, what is it the Petro I, I haven't heard anything about it so I, I don't know if it's still in existence I don't know if it's being mined I, I don't know what the status is on it but I would venture to guess it's probably dead by now Nonetheless, it, it, it's an example of what I'm talking about here where y you can't make people value this shit. Venezuelans probably took one look at the Petro, took a look at its market metrics and said, you know what, I'd much rather be buying things with Ethereum or Litecoin or even Dogecoin. I would rather use Dogecoin to buy my groceries then use the Petro. Because I know that the Dogecoin blockchain is public. That there are multiple copies of it. And, and it's funny, there, there was this um, poll I found on Twitter, and I don't know if it has an associated article. I'm checking and verifying right now. Um, but there was something I found. It was saying that people trust the Bitcoin blockchain more than they trust the Federal Reserve. And to me, this isn't really surprising at all. Because the the fact of the matter is, is that the Bitcoin blockchain is public. You know, people like you and me mine it. That's why we trust it. It's not because, you know, somebody told us to trust it. It's because it has a higher standard of trust than the Federal Reserve has. You know, and I, I had posted in reply to that on Twitter that um, the, the reason that is is because we know exactly 
how many Bitcoin will ever be mined. We know how many have been mined. We know how many there are left to be mined. And we know the rate at which they're going to be mined, or re relatively speaking. There are, there are glitches now and then in the duration of time between block rewards, but it's more or less 10 minutes. So, again, we know all of these things about Bitcoin. We do not know these things about Federal Reserve notes. We don't know how many there are in existence. We don't know how many there are in circulation. We do not know the rate of new creation of funds, or, or, or notes, rather. And so, yes, we trust Bitcoin and its blockchain more than we trust the Federal Reserve. Until the Federal Reserve, or the Federal Reserve note rather, is an actual cryptocurrency that the public can mine and the public can dev for and the public can write apps for and all that other shit, this is going to continue to be true. You know, unless the Federal Reserve issues their own cryptocurrency with its own Genesis block and its own blockchain its own mining algorithm and all that other shit until that happens they are at a deficit with regard to trust when it comes to cryptocurrencies dogecoin is more trustable even being capless is more trustable because we know how many there are we know how many have been mined its blockchain is public as long as these facts remain true about Dogecoin, it will be one up over the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Something to keep in mind. <sighs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw it back down into some music. It has been a little while. And, uh, let's see. Here we go. A little bit of Power Man for you. Bombshell. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Ministry with Punch in the Face. <sighs> I, I, I gotta tell you, I'm really, really happy that uh, the tournament that I participated in did not include any intentional strikes to the face. So anyway, as we were talking before the music break about the big boys getting into crypto, getting a taste for it, here it is. George Soros makes a U-turn set to trade cryptocurrency. And this is actually authored on uh, April 7th, 2018. 1800 hours by uh, Pr Prieshu Garg. And so, yes, penis. Continuing on. <clears throat> it appears George Soros has made a U-turn. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on trying to make sure that this is actually part of the article and not just no never mind that's a synopsis we're getting into it here getting involved in the crypto market according to a recent article in bloomberg adam fisher the macro investment manager at soros fund management firm has been given internal approval to begin trading cryptocurrencies the Soros Management Fund firm is reportedly worth $26 billion. Unconfirmed reports also revealed that though Fisher has been given the go-ahead, no trades have been made as of yet and there is no official word on when trading will commence. Despite his reservations about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, George Soros has indirectly been placing wagers on the market. And hold on one second, I gotta check something out here. Something's tripping on me. Every every once in a while this program will like flash like I'm like something's wrong with it or something like that. And you know, I gotta I gotta like click on it and make sure that we're still broadcasting and everything's fine. And it looks like everything's okay, so we're gonna continue on. 
Let's see. Despite his reservations about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, Soros has indirectly been placing wagers on the market. The Soros fund management firm has been able to amass a considerable portion of Overstock.com shares. The bulk of this acquisition occurred over the last quarter of 2017 and made the firm the third largest shareholder in the company. This purchase is significant because Overstock.com, one of the largest discount e-commerce companies in the world, became the first major online retail merchant to accept cryptocurrency payments over the summer of 2017. Soros isn't the only macro investment firm that is making a play for the crypto market. John Burbank and Passport Capital have also made a foray into the world of digital currency trading. After shuttering his central fund in 2017, Burbank hopes to raise about $150 million for a couple of funds that will be forward, focused on digital currency trading. The plans took off at the beginning of 2018, and so far, the funds have limited themselves to investors from family offices and a number of other wealthy investors. Alan Howard is another notable macro investor who is involved in the crypto market. In 2017, the billionaire placed a number of significant bets on the crypto market, separate from his own trading firm's activities. Presumably on the healthy profits made from last year's run, Howard has declared that he wishes to invest more in the crypto market and even in blockchain technology solutions. A fan of blockchain, but not crypto. Gosh, I wonder why. Despite being a crypto critic, Soros is a noted advocate of blockchain technology. And just one thing, Mr. Soros, you don't have real blockchains without incentivized public miners. That that's you don't get one without the other. So you can just fuck off with that idea. Speaking during the World Economic Forum in Davos, Soros unveiled a plan that involved using blockchain technology to solve the mounting refugee crisis. Pfft, whatever. You know what will solve the fucking refugee crisis? Quit carpet bombing them. That will solve the fucking refugee crisis. If you don't displace them, they don't become refugees and go somewhere else. A blockchain isn't going to do shit to stop that. The need to improve the well-being of migrants and refugees continues to be a significant pursuit of Soros. However, despite his recognition of potential applications of blockchain technology, Soros has less than flattering views on Bitcoin and other virtual currencies. Yeah, I know, because we run them, not you, asshole. Fuck you. Uh. You know, I, I don't really care that these people are investing in cryptocurrencies. And I don't even care that they're they're gaslighting little projects and and burning them out on cocaine and hookers. I, I really don't. Because this is what these people have always done. And you know what? If you're trying to base your product your project on on the premise that you're going to get a significant amount of VC capital to run it you can rest assured that it will not be in your hands if it becomes successful. Because before you know it, they will be making offers for it. The whole thing. They'll be offering to buy you out. And unless that was part of your plan, uh, <laughs> you're going to be a little bit disappointed. And you know, there, there are serial entrepreneurs out there that get involved in projects just to blow them up and whatnot, but you know, I, I would consider them kind of like mercenaries or like bounty hunters in that aspect. Kind of hobbling potential competitors early on. And, and I, I've said this before that chasing adoption leads to corruption. 
This isn't a, a like some fallacy, man. This is a fucking truism. You start chasing adoption, all you are going to find is groups like the ones run by George Soros and Goldman Sachs buying you out of your project or getting it by other malicious means. Because, you know, we are, we are fragile creatures. There are plenty of ways to get to us. And if somebody wants to bump you out for a contention for competition, they'll do it. Or at least they'll try. And so it's best to be watching out for your bunghole on that point. And among the worst possible things you could be doing is walking to these people with your hand out. Because you, you might as well just like drop trow and bend over. <laughs> because that's about what you're going to get out of them you know you might get a good price for your ass but that's that's about all you're going to get out of them and uh <clears throat> i got one little extension on that and it was on bloomberg here and uh if this is just a the original uh, article let's see here blah 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 a macro manager channel. Uh, this seems a little bit more in depth, so we'll, we'll go for it. This is on Bloomberg te- Bloomberg.com. George Soros prepares to trade cryptocurrencies. George Soros called cryptocurrencies a bubble in January. Now his twenty-six billion dollar family office is planning to trade digital assets. Adam Fisher, who oversees macro investing at New York-based Soros Fund Management, got internal approval. Yeah, it's basically the same article. Never mind. Yeah, we already gone over this ground. We expect it to happen. The and, and you know what? This this is something that's been expected to happen. In, in another two to five years, we're not going to see a lot of the organizations and coins that we see now. A lot of these ICOs will be dead. But the question will be whether or not there is still enthusiasm in the minds of the young and entrepreneurial in uh, trying to solve the problem of transacting monetary value from person to person without having to involve a third party. Which we've already solved, but you know, apparently people have gotten off on this idea of fucking store value and all this other bullshit and gotten off the track of what exactly Bitcoin was intended to achieve. You know, the the fact that Soros and Goldman and all these guys are investing in this, it, it's pretty immaterial to me. <clears throat> because in the longer term, if Bitcoin or whatever project that they invest in decides that they want to turn tyrannical, we will have the option, we have the models of where this shit was, was previously established to work. We have the software and it's just a matter of starting over again. And again, they cannot force you to value it. You know, I mean, really, do you think all the mining farms are just going to fucking disappear? No. If they lose utility on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, if they're not making enough money on the Bitcoin blockchain, they will drop it and they will mine something else. Something that other people value. Or people in the just Bitcoin people in general that have become disaffected with the way that Bitcoin is operating, and, and that's the competitive aspect of cryptocurrencies that we are going to spend at least, I would say, at least the next decade hammering down. I really don't believe that this is going to be the same as like television and internet and all that other shit because number one, it's open source software that this is all based on. Now, of course, at some point or another, the resources and the nature of them may change over time. You know, GitHub might not always be available, but there will be a means for us to transmit files to one another and get the whole thing started again 
and started in ways that aren't currently being monitored or cannot be monitored monitored in the way that Bitcoin is. It, and of course, some of those projects have already begun and are already here. But we'll get into that. But anyway, I, I had mentioned this article previously, you know, and uh, I did want to get into it because the uh, title of it alone, I just, I love it. And uh, this is on uh, CCN.com. People trust Satoshi Nakamoto more than the federal Re- than the U.S. Federal Reserve, NYSE owner. In Inter- International Exchange Inc. I s- it, the owner and operator of the New York Stock Exchange is keeping an eye on the nascent cryptocurrency trading markets. Speaking t- with Bloomberg, uh, Jeffrey Sprechter, you know what? <laughs> Fuck these people. We're not going to read this article and then read the goddamn Bloomberg article. There we go. We're going to get it straight from Bloomberg because, you know what? Bloomberg wrote it. So, fuck you. (coughs) My apologies, sir. Alright, so yeah, get rid of that one. Here we go. ICE's chief says cryptocurrency trading is a trend we can't ignore. This is by um, Viren Vigella. Um, No indication of penis on this page, but let's... uh, No, I don't want to see other stories by whoever this is. Anyway, Viren Vegna or Vegella. Here we go. Bloomberg Technology. And it was authored on April 9th. 7.17 7.17 a.m. PDT. What? Okay, whatever PDT is. Intercontinental Exchange, Inc., the owner of the New York Stock Exchange on Monday, refused to rule out starting futures contracts on digital currencies following in the footsteps of two of its rivals. Quote, There is a trend here we can't ignore, in my mind, so I don't discount it, Jeffrey Sprechter. ICE's chief executive officer said in an interview on Bloomberg TV, quote, People put more faith in a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto that no one has ever met than they do in the U.S. Fed, he said, referring to the founder of Bitcoin. Uh, and on that point, sir, no, we don't put more faith in Satoshi Nakamoto. We put more faith in the miners <laughs> whose activity we can actually monitor. Continuing on, dozens of small exchanges have mushroomed in recent years to capitalize on the growing popularity of trading cryptocurrency assets, even as theft and regulatory scrutiny curb some of the initial enthusiasm. Traditional exchange operators have rolled out offerings for their own customers to capitalize on the price volatility. In December, CME Group and CBOE Global Markets Inc. Stated, started futures contracts on Bitcoin, while NASDAQ Inc. is also considering introducing them. Quote, People are more comfortable in technology than the institutions of government and society that I grew up with, Sprecher said. Yeah, let's see here. And that's it. And what is this next article here? Crypto traders per oh, we're definitely gonna click on that one. Um, but yeah, so there you have it. <laughs> People put more faith in Satoshi Nakamoto than the uh, Federal Reserve, and and they're right that they can't ignore cryptocurrency trading anymore. I mean, it they they should have been if they haven't been involved since about 2014 2015 and, and I would wager that they have been involved since at least then you know I I think it's kind of a fantasy that they haven't been we know for a fact that Goldman Sachs has been and I mean if you look at just the the identity of uh, all of the members of R3 that is still a thing R3 still exists 
and Goldman Sachs has more than one of its sock puppets up under the uh, the umbrella of R3. You know, they, it's not... How should I say this? It's not really reflective of uh, organic cryptocurrency growth. I'm kind of outnumbered there by Goldman Sachs representatives. But fortunately, R3 can't tell you what to value either. No more than the Federal Reserve can. I mean, they could say, value this, but whether or not you actually listen to them, that's a whole different story. And I, I think that's the the power of cryptocurrencies that people that that would be in a position to fear such a thing do fear it. Which I don't understand why they would fear it only because I envision that this is available to all of us. And you don't need to be Goldman Sachs to be involved anymore. You don't need to be Chase Manhattan to be involved anymore. And uh, to that point, I got this other article here on Bloomberg. Crypto traders protest Poland's tax decision. And uh, this is written by Konrad Krasuski, Krasuski, uh, April 9th, 2018, 9.07 a.m. PDT. And then updated again at 4 p.m. PDT. Digital currency traders in Poland are protesting against a government decision to levy a tax on all cryptocurrency transactions, regardless of whether the taxpayer made a profit. The finance ministry published an interpretation of the country's tax code last week, stating that income from transactions on cryptocurrencies is subject to income tax rules, with two tax brackets of 18% and 32%. More painful for traders, the tax authority said that the act of selling or purchasing digital currencies should be considered a transfer transfer of property rights, which is subject to a 1% levy on the value of the transaction in line with rules governing civil law agreements. Cryptocurrency traders organized an online petition saying that the rules are set to wipe out their community and could set the country back in terms of developing the blockchain technology underpinning digital currencies. The ministry's stance was published weeks before the deadline for polls to file their annual personal income statements on April 30th. Signed by more than 2,200 people, the petition says that new regulations will mean that capital invested in cryptocurrencies may be taxed, quote, hundreds or even thousand or even a thousand times, while Prime Minister Marwecki Mur- has called digital currencies, quote, Ponzi schemes in an effort to turn polls away from such investments. The government and state-owned lenders generally support blockchain as a source of innovation in the banking industry, i.e. they don't want you in it. Quote, We are demanding the release of the blockchain technology market and the abolition of all taxes related to this industry, according to the petition. Quote, We want to be active creators of this technology, not just its passive recipients in the coming years from centralized Polish institutions or foreign entities. The finance ministry said on its website on Monday that it's working on a, quote, more convenient method of taxation for cryptocurrencies while repeating that last week's statement showed the binding interpretations of the current regulations. And and I can tell you right now, Poland, uh, your your finance minister, this is to you. Um, I can almost guarantee you that you're not going to get a real high level of compliance among those 2,200 people or the others that never bothered to uh, sign on to that petition because of course they didn't want to indicate their identity at all Um, but yeah I I don't expect that this interpretation of the country's tax code is is going to mean jack shit in, in people reporting on their taxes 
I've already stated my my stance on it, and honestly, I think it's probably the most reasonable way to go about it for everybody involved, is that you only consider A, transactions where you actually realized a profit, i.e., you sold the coins, and, and not necessarily at a profit, but you do you would want to have to you would want to report it if you experienced a material loss between when you initiated your your transaction from fiat to cryptocurrencies and then back from cryptocurrencies to fiat again if you did experience a material loss including things like transaction fees and exchange fees and all that other bullshit you'll definitely want to be counting that especially on transactions where you are cashing out to fiat currency because in my mind these are one of two classes of taxable events with regard to cryptocurrency one if you exchange it for fiat currency two if you use it as a means of transacting monetary value denominated in an equivalent fiat currency so in in the case of the US for example right if you pay somebody twenty dollars worth of verge for a good or a service the twenty dollars itself is a taxable event on the part of the recipient of those funds so they would have to report twenty dollars worth of income at that moment now whether they if they experience a material loss from the point where they actually receive the funds to to cashing the funds out to fiat currency then of course they would be able to report that loss as well as the transaction fees from getting it from cryptocurrency back to fiat but that's it now of course if they do experience a capital gain from the point of receiving that $20, say by the time they actually cash it out, it comes out to be $25 worth of verge, which at the current market velocity is entirely feasible, honestly, even given the the uh, speed of the transaction volume on, on the Bitcoin, on the verge network. But anyway, point being that they could experience a $5 gain so that you know from the point that they actually receive the twenty dollars to the point they actually cash it out they could experience a five dollar gain and then they would want to pay capital gains tax on the capital differential differential between when they receive the funds and when they cash them out but the that in my mind that's the extent of your tax liability with regard to cryptocurrencies and again this shit is optional now if all of your funds are tied up in cryptocurrencies and you have possession of the vast majority of them there isn't anybody that can seize them from you and if you've stashed them appropriately that really is true that nobody else can access them but you And I mean, I, it, when it comes down to that, then we start talking about the expense of enforcement. And you know, you might be able to get away with it kind of efficiently. You might actually make a return. You know, if you're a national or state or a national government, you might actually make a return by busting individuals. But in doing so, you'll be revealing the means of detection. And also the the means by which you use to investigate these people, because you do have to take them court eventually to court eventually, and people do pay attention to things like exactly how you investigated the individual that you're prosecuting, and in doing so, we'll figure out a way around you, and then it'll be back to the races again. But yeah, the, this whole thing, like the finance ministry pretending like they, they have the capability to dictate down to the cryptocurrency market at large, <clears throat> I, you, you might be able to get the Polish to to comply um, 
I doubt that that'll be the case. I think you'll probably experience an insurrection before that happens, um, because the alternative that you provide is not viable to those people. They didn't give up your national currency for no reason. They didn't transition to cryptocurrency for no reason. They did it because it was advantageous for them to do so. And why would you ask them to give up that ad- advantage? I, I think we, we covered it in this in this article right here that the, the traders are telling you themselves that the level of regulatory burden that you're wishing to impose on the cryptocurrency space within your border will put you at a, technolo- a technological disadvantage over the longer term. If you're not allowing this to flourish within your borders, you'll be self-selecting yourself to be out of it. And you'll be doing so only at the level of your national government. Because I can guarantee you right now, some of your people will continue to do what they've been doing without your knowledge. And they're not going to stop doing it the way they've been doing it just because you tell them to do so. This is, again, the mad quagmire of the 21st century. The mutually assured destruction quagmire of the 21st century. Make no mistake about it. This is not patty cake. This is a fucking war. And the war is actually a a matter of choice now. Of whether or not you want to continue to trust some cabal of bankers that aren't really accountable to you. They're accountable to their shareholders, ultimately. And they're trying to make a profit for those people, and not necessarily you. And now that you have an option of of shifting to currencies that don't work like that, that offer you advantages in the marketplace with how fast you can move your money and where you can move your money to and who you can transact with and so on and so forth... Why, why would you go back to it? Why, why would you go back to some com, construction that is artificial? You know, it, it doesn't have any any real teeth in this market. And you know, we've we've covered this a million times already, and I'll cover it a million times again on this show. That these people they are involved in cryptocurrencies. And when I say these people, I'm talking about like the finance minister. He or his kid or his or his wife or his auntie or his grandma or his brother-in-law or somebody is involved in cryptocurrencies and is making a significant sum of money in cryptocurrencies. And should they bring the hammer down on this bullshit or try to or talk like they are going to, this person is going to notify them, hey... Dude, there's an election in a year, right? Well, right now, I'm I'm fucking KFAing on cryptocurrencies. If you go ahead and enact this taxation regime that you're wanting to impose on us, that all goes away. I'm not going to be able to contribute shit to your campaign. So you best, like, wake the fuck up and get the fuck off my jock here and let me fund your campaign next time around. Because I'm perfectly willing to do so if you, like, stay off my jog here and, and let me do my thing. Just step off. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw it back down. A little bit of music here. Megadeth. Peace cells. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Tool with Schism. That's certainly a... Uh, crowd pleaser everybody likes tool and one of those bands that like if you don't like tool you don't like music <laughs> i mean it's like there's something wrong with you <laughs> anyway uh, i got this uh this next article and i've been dying to read this one because this is this is like this is us you know this is verge people you know this is just for us and uh this is on uh, medium.com um chris chase is the author um, from the picture? Yes, 
penis. And uh, this is authored April 9th, so we got it fresh today. <clears throat> Continuing on, Verge Currency solves blockchain vulnerability in record time. And uh, yeah, this is authored by Chris Chase. Verge Currency XVG has hit the news again this week for a reason some would consider, quote, negative news. However, strip away the drama and hashtag topics that tend to blindly fuel social, uh, social media, and the reality is this. It's just another day at the office in the world of crypto. Well, blockchain technology has begun to affirmatively plant its feet into our daily lives, we have to remind ourselves what it actually is so we can better understand the technical complexities involved in creating and maintaining such a revolutionary technology. Blockchain is a series of protected blocks that essentially have depth, also known as the chain, where each block is a series of computations processed by computers that are spread across a network all over the world. These, these blocks utilize extremely complex cryptography that is impossible and nearly, I'm sorry, improbable and nearly impossible to undo. With the strength and protection that blockchain provides, vulnerabilities are few and far between. As some of the most talented minds have, have united to further enhance and develop this technology for the world and for the greater good, there are always a few bad actors looking to exploit minor vulnerabilities <coughs> within an ecosystem. In most instances, the crosshairs point to any and all cryptocurrencies with the greatest potential and who have proven to demonstrate steady growth. Last week, Verge Currency stepped into the spotlight of a targeted attack, resulting in a, in a solution which required an intended fork <coughs> pardon me, to, to happen at block uh, 204 uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 2,042,000. The exploit was related to one of the mining algorithms script. <clears throat> We've seen very similar situations unfold in the past with other cryptocurrencies, such as Ethereum, who also forked to solve the issue. Litecoin, Bitcoin, Monero, and several others. The integrity and technology of any of these coins have neither suffered nor faced any issue in future growth. As a matter of fact, these quote hacks essentially highlight what needs fixing and provides an opportunity for any coin or token to further strengthen its network and technology and effectively that is what Verge has done. <clears throat> Within any growing industry, new challenges and issues are often encountered during stages of successful accomplishment, however, what separates the weak from the strong is how these are dealt with and how quickly a top priority problem is resolved. When faced with such a challenge, Verge has proven itself to operate and react the way any reliable top contender should. In the past, the above mentioned cryptocurrencies took weeks to solve their issues, what some would consider a fair amount of time. Meanwhile, Verge, XVG, solved the entire issue within 72 hours, including prepared updates for the wallets. The team truly came together during this process, from development, uh, development marketing, tech support, to community management and long-standing member support. The united efforts of all provided clear insight into just how strong Verge truly is. Soonrock, a man of few words, additionally found extra time to jump in and out of discussions, providing clarity on updates while he worked around the clock. 
the team remained in constant contact with its community via social platforms and is still working tirelessly to provide the cor correct information to those who have still not been made aware. Verge was extremely impressed with the response time from Bittrex and Binance after a call was placed <coughs> informing them of what was happening. They took immediate action and proactive measures to provide protection to all accounts and transactions. With so many exchanges popping up these days, unparalleled support like that is crucial to the ongoing success of cryptocurrencies. This was also the case for all mining pools, as they have a line of direct communication to the team at all times. Verge Core team welcomed the discussion about all available details related to the solution throughout the entire process. As a testament to XVG's potential growth, the market did not react negatively aside from brief periods of volatility, with the overall price continuing to soar on speculation of a, of a major upcoming partnership. The partner was made aware of the issue immediately and were in fact impressed with Verge's response time in providing a solution. Large corporations are no stranger to challenges of similar nature and were very understanding of what needed to be done. The partnership is still on track for its April 17th announcement. <clears throat> Needless to say, while blogger news circulates headlines ranging from positive to negative, targeting their specific audience, Verge has proven that its focus on performance, technology, and community is of paramount importance. It will continue to adapt and evolve in preparation for achieving mass adoption and is proud of its community who truly takes the time to understand the facts. The rest is merely noise of an excited industry where all fa falsities will eventually be filtered out by persistent progress. More information about, for more information about Verge, please visit vergecurrency.com. Yeah, boy. Let's show the responses. Let's see what they got. Oh, shit. We got to check this one out. This is by uh, <clears throat> Lambo Mining Pool. Um, one minute read. I'm calling bullshit on this article. And I've been a supporter of Verge for a while. For one, the Verge team were slow to act when the attack was first highlighted by OC Miner. Then they stated that there would be a, quote, quick fix applied and that no hard fork would be necessary. <clears throat> they applied the so-called fix after a botched attempt, only for OC Miner to have to point out to them that they had actually unintentionally hard forked, the fix that was applied made it impossible to complete a wallet sync. Intentional hard fork? Yeah, right. Plus, they seriously tried to downplay the severity of the situation. They left a tweet up for almost a whole day stating that the problem was resolved were reluctant to own up to their mistakes and did not show up any appreciation for having the issues pointed out to them in the first place. The way they handled this entire situation was unprofessional and concerning to say the least. To anything, some, anyone who thinks I'm just trolling, you can view, view the entire thread for yourself and review the GitHub code, which there are links to in the thread. Blah 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 blah. blah. Spin again. Forgot to mention the attacker basically walked away with 50 million verge. Yeah, that that was totally fucking bullshit. First of all, I'm the fucking source code, which was fixed a long time ago, but soon we to do a professional job. Second, only Mac OS wallet was released in. Blah blah blah. Yeah, so you know, um, I'm seeing a lot of people calling bullshit on this. And there, there was a significant loss with regard to that. Um, there, uh, according to this one, one quote here it was fifty million verge. That's uh, quite a million XVG. Quite, quite a few. <clears throat> Let's see. The fix was from the lead dev tried to immediately at one time. Yeah, 
Let's let's read this one. Uh, the article is full of bullshit, and this is by uh, Nasco Philov. Uh, the article is full of bullshit. I wonder how there is any space for letters to fit. Yeah. You know, I will say this. It's still running. Um, <clears throat> from what I understand, the fork did in fact resolve the issue. So, yeah. <sighs> you know, this is crypto. And... There's there's no accounting for that. But I will say this, that uh, as far as the interval of resolution and the fashion of resolution, considering the organizational structure of XVG, which isn't all that organized, honestly, but does have some some organizational structure, enough to sustain the coin successfully across multiple pools and multiple exchanges and multiple clients. So you really got to look at that and say, you know, it's like you've got a, a community of volunteers and, and there are some paid people, I'm assuming. Uh, I don't know. I'm not one of them, so I can't really speak to that. Who have dedicated their time and effort to it. And it's, and as I said, it's one of the oldest altcoins on the market. So, as long as the blockchain is actually reliable and running, I think that's what's important. But there, there was a reordering attack, and, and really, I mean, gotta be, gotta be on it. On it, kids! said it multiple times this episode this is war this is not something that's going to be casual and easy especially in the in the coming year or so I think this year is going to be most crucial to be on your toes because man you know they, they they might have been they might have been swinging low earlier but they're gonna be they're gonna be swinging low and looking to sweep the leg now, and and I don't think there's been a time when there's more scrutiny focused on coins, and and so with that comes accountability, you know, and and all you can do is your best effort, and not everybody's gonna be happy with what you do, but you know. You can either do do something or do nothing. And honestly, I'm I'm happy that something was done. That attempts were made to resolve the issue, that it wasn't just left to run. You know, I mean, a, as screwed up as that was, I think there are other things going on in crypto that are ongoing. <laughs> that are as bad if not worse but like I said at least at least the issue has to my knowledge at least been resolved so you know I'm, I'm satisfied with that anyway the next one I got here is on motherboard and uh, this one I, I'm kind of kind of kind of I don't know let's go for it a blockchain startup is calling for sex workers to out congressman clients who supported FOSTA. Spank chain and I, I is this real? I, I'm gonna read this because I don't I don't know if this is real or, or whatever. Spank chain is offering twenty five thousand for information on politicians who use sexual services while supporting an, the anti-trafficking bill. An Ethereum startup is offering $25,000 to the first 10 sex workers who come forward with information about clients who are also members of Congress who voted to pass the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, FOSTA. The campaign is run by SpankChain, which had its ICO in October and is one of several recent startups for sex 
on the blockchain. The company is attempting to break into the often expensive discriminatory world of the adult industry payment processing using the blockchain. 97 senators voted to pass FOSTA-SESTA in March. It will become law if the president signs it this week. FOSTA-SESTA is a mashup bill that incorporates part parts of Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, SESTA, and was framed by supporters as an anti-sex trafficking measure. Open internet activ activists and sex, sex workers warned it would endanger people more instead of helping actual victims of trafficking by making websites more liable for what their users do and say on their platforms. <clears throat> In less than a month after its passage, there have all been, already been re repercussions on the industry and beyond, including the shutdown of Craigslist personals and stricter enforcement of Google Drive's policies on sexual content. Janice Griffith, co-founder of Spank Chain and adult performer, told me in an adult in an email that the that the company hasn't yet decided what it will do with the information it gathers from this campaign. Whether the information is published will involve a quote, mutual decision between Spank Chain and the person coming forward, she said. We hopefully plan to utilize information gathered for leverage against elected officials whose political motives are hypocritical and selfish, pushing legislation that endangers instead of protecting, outlawing, and putting the same people they purchase services and time from at risk, Griffith said. Many lawmakers have resigned because they have preached conservatism to their constituency and passed laws that hurt women while simultaneously practicing the behavior they speak out against. But, sex worker rights advocate Kate D'Amando, or, or Adamo, my apologies, told me that Spank Chain's idea could further harm the industry. She said in an email that at first glance it seems like Spank Chain is, quote, capitalizing on the stigma of the sex trade and using it to shame someone while not caring about the collateral damage that this kind of thing does to sex worker rights. Diadamo said, uh, I'm sorry, compared it to the kind of political reward money stunts pornographer Larry Flint used to pull in the 1990s. Quote, this is entirely about being angry about the bill and nothing to do with sex worker support. <clears throat> Spank Chain said it plans to pay people who do come forward in either U.S. dollars or Ethereum, whichever the sex worker prefers. Quote, we want to expose the hypocrisy and corrupt representation that exists within our government working not to serve the people but attack them for their choices and allow lives lost as collateral damage under a charade of well intent, Griffith said. SESTA does not serve to actually end sex trafficking or forced labor of any kind. Rather, it pushes consensual workers out of places they have created for themselves and criminals further underground. A blockchain startup is calling for sex workers to out congressman clients who support FOSTA. Hmm. Well, I can't say that I actually agree with um, blackmail. I mean, you know, that that's what leverage is. It's just blackmail. I mean, call it some other thing. But, you know, <clears throat> at some point, they do have to have some sort of reaction. And if not this kind of reaction, exposing the the depth of hypocrisy being being uh, performed here, I, I I don't know. People are human. Uh, humans are human. I mean, people like sex. So 
using sex to shame them. I don't. I don't really think that serves anybody. I mean, because really, it's like once you start chucking that rock, how long before those those rocks start coming to your glass house? And really, is your behavior so virtuous that you can withstand that kind of thing? You know, I mean, if if we want to talk about shame, <laughs> you know, we're, and we want to talk about hypocrisy here, you know, what what kind of message are you saying that you're willing to use shame and hypocrisy in a hypocritical way? Because again, it's only so it's only so long before those rocks start coming back. And, you know, at one point or another, you will be held accountable, I'm sure. So, you know, I think that the Internet is a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing. And we're not entirely sure how to use it yet. I mean, we're starting to figure it out. It's obvious. <clears throat> You know, we, we do have capability of monitoring to the to a very, very wide extent, much wider than we've ever had before. However, to what end? Is it just to be some nanny state tattletale, put you in jail behind bars bullshit charade? Is, is that all it is? If so, you can count me out of that shit. But if it's something of trying to create a better future for all of us and and when I say a better future I'm not just meaning you know sans a certain people or a certain grouping of people or whatever whatever I don't I don't really believe in a merit there you know using people's sexual preferences as as shame that or or a uh, a point to shame them on uh, that doesn't seem very virtuous to me. You know, people are who they are. Trying to use that as a point of shaming, it's no better than racism. You know, or ageism. Or any other ism-ism. I don't know, there's so much concentration on trying to divide people, you know, and subsect people. You know, and I, I find that more times than not, those act as artificial barriers to commerce and all kinds of things that should be happening but aren't really happening because people don't want to talk to one another because they think there's actually some some major difference between you and them on an intrinsic level that means you can't do commerce with them. And so that, that blocks all kinds of commerce and all kinds of other good things that could be happening as a result of that. And, you know, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm pulling a little bit of, I don't know, ethos from uh, The Last Jedi to let old things die. You know, old divisions. I don't know why we need to really honor them if they aren't serving us anymore. Now, if they do serve a function, well, you know, let's look at the function. Is it entirely virtuous to all involved? Does it does it provide the intended result? And is the intended result, in fact, virtuous? You know? I think we're getting to a point in technology where we don't really have to accept bottlenecks that we had before. We don't have to accept them anymore. It's optional. And with that, we really got to start taking account of when we're deciding against efficiency and against future growth. And really wonder who that serves. Does it serve us? I don't think so. You know, it's like with regard to cryptocurrencies as a whole. You know, nobody invited banks to to this. We were happy trading amongst one another. And everything was going just fine. And banks decided they wanted to get in. And so now they're here. And that's fine. They're people too. 
but I don't see that their participation should see any uh, deference, should I say. You know, that their their code is just as good as the 14-year-old code, 14-year-old's uh, code who, who wrote it in Kazakhstan, you know? If, in fact, it actually does what it's supposed to do and it's, in fact, profitable for the the individuals involved to participate in. You know, sometimes it's not. And you gotta, you got to question when it isn't, you know, why it isn't. Anyway, we are wrapping up, coming down to the end of the line. We will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, as usual. And, uh, and, and also, as usual, you'll be able to find this episode and others up on my YouTube channel, um, as well as find me on Twitter and in the Verge Telegram. Um, I try to go to the Verge IRC too, but sometimes there's there's something goofy going on with my computer where I'm just I'm pro I'm doing too much shit at once. It kind of lags things down. <laughs> I've been thinking about supplementing, getting another machine to you know do some of the activities that I that I'm trying to perform at the same time during the show. But anyway, anyway, like I said, we will be back again on Wednesday. And so until then, I want y'all to trade safe. Meaning, don't make trades that you can't walk away from. Do your homework. Because you never know. Something might be around the corner that's just as good, if not better. And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody is going to do it for you. And as time goes on, at least for a little while, more people will be trying to get to it. <laughs> and it is with that I'd like to close out this episode. I'm not entirely certain what I want to throw down for our last dance. I hadn't picked anything out. Um, and why not? I've been dying to play a little bit of Static X here. Cannibal. Last dance. Here on Coin Metal. Thank you very, very much for listening, and you all have an excellent evening.